My name is Pete Spaluto, and I'm a former hot dogger. I was in Germany, and I was on leave and dove into a pool and broke my neck. So I'm a Vietnam era veteran, but no, never saw Vietnam. Before I got into hot dogs, I uh, had just finished uh, doing a little college thing. Went to school for quite a while, and I just graduated with uh, three bachelor degrees in business, government, and psychology, and decided it was time to take a vacation. So I went to Hawaii for six months, and uh, kind of had two more people in my life, my wife and my son, that weren't there before, and when I came back, it was like now three of us need a little bit more money than what I was used to. So I decided to get into the hot dog business. It was a business that required minimal investment with maximum return. In New Jersey, honorably discharged veterans and firemen had a state-granted license that allowed them to pedal, hawk, and vend any goods, any wares, any merchandise. So I bought a hot dog cart and went to Point Pleasant Beach, New Jersey. They started ticketing us. They wanted us to stop selling hot dogs. They, I had a license, but they wanted to revoke it just because they were getting a lot of heat from local merchants. I said, well, what did I do wrong? You know, what was, what was the problem? Was anything bad? Was the food bad? Was the conditions unsanitary? Was anything wrong? Look, you didn't do anything wrong, but you can't sell hot dogs. A lot of the local merchants are complaining. We pay upward of $4,000 a year taxes, plus ordinance fees and licensing fees to be in business in this town, and a street vendor pays $25. So when it started getting cold, now I had a hot dog cart and nowhere to go with it. So I went to Atlantic City, and I kind of like told him before we came, like, you can't tell me I'm not going to vend there because I've just gone through all the courts, and I know what the game is about, and I'm coming there to sell hot dogs. And the first day, we sold out by 3.30. We had no more hot dogs. My brother says to me, uh, you know, geez, is there anything that I can do selling these hot dogs? Because I could use a little extra money, and I'd like to, to get involved. I started doing it the night shift. Uh -huh. We tried it out for a few weeks. And, uh, you know, like I say, it looked like it was going to be a moneymaker. So now here's this one cart where I worked it during the day with Jimmy, and we made money. Mike came down, took it from us. He made money. Then Sly took it from him, and he made money. So this car just kept pumping out money 24 hours. But it's all my brother's fault. He kept, <laughs> he kept telling me, buy more carts, buy more carts. One car was doing so good, you know, well, let, let's try another one across the street. And while we had one at the Sands, we put one across the street at Bally's. Two work real good. Let, let's try five. Uh -huh. Five worked even better. Uh -huh. you know, so. Little by little, every, every couple of weeks, we picked up another five carts. The casinos, when they set up, they were geared for the high rollers. They were geared for, you know, nice restaurants, elaborate food. And they really didn't have a thought for fast food. I came in with one cart, one cart in October. And by March, we had like 45 carts. We were forced to hire only veterans, people really that weren't in the mainstream of the labor force. There were people that went through the wars and went through the military, and most of them were Vietnam era people. That uh, that war left everybody a little confused. A lot of them had uh, alcohol problems, drug problems, whatever, but they were still ready and willing to work every day, and they were out there manning that car and doing the best they could to sell them hot dogs and make that money. I mean, these are guys that didn't have a job, that weren't making any money, that really were unemployed, that now improved their self-esteem, gave them a sense of self-worth, made them feel better, and they were loyal. You like hot dogs, ooh, eating fast, moving on the street, I buy you a hot dog. When it started, I was one of his uh, first remnants.
Pete saved the, the convict from going back. I like drugs, man. I went to, to the joint for drugs. And, I mean, I, I, I was talking to a educated man. Pete, you know, I learned a lot. I, I wouldn't be, be here, you know, talking to you if it wasn't for him. Uh, they were bringing in over 5,000 buses here a day filled with people. Uh -huh. And these people didn't have a lot of money to spend when they were leaving the casino. They were looking for a hot dog and a soda to get <laughs> for that long bus ride home. The money end was unbelievable. Uh -huh. I mean, on a good day, you could take in $4,000. Uh -huh. uh, uh, it was just incredible, and going home with 30 to 40 percent of that, you know, the vendors were doing okay for themselves. Even on a bad day when it was raining out, you would definitely go home with at least $100 in your pocket. We had one guy that worked on a Tropicana, and from Friday to Monday, he earned enough to buy a van, like a $4,000 van. That was his share. Uh -huh. The way that business took off was, you know, it's totally amazing. No idea. I, I figured the business, yeah, you make $100. Uh -huh. You know, that was, you know, $100, that'd be good. And I was like, wow, $1,000. <laughs> uh -huh. Everyone's so concerned that the vendors are going to become millionaires. Do you think that's possible under this existing ordinance? Well, let alone the ordinance, uh, I think even if there wasn't any ordinance at all, I'd like to know how I'm going to become a millionaire. So I wish somebody would tell me. First year of business, we reported. This is an IRS tax return of a gross of over $4 million. It was an interesting way to make money and an interesting way to meet people, especially celebrities. A lot of celebrities bought hot dogs from me on the carts. Red Fox came down and bought a hot dog from me. Got Dolly Parton and all sorts of celebrities bought hot dogs from us. It was pretty neat. We had a vendor on Illinois and Pacific, and he was vending right outside of a restaurant. And the restaurant owner was upset because he felt that this guy was taking business away from him. He was selling steaks and lobster, and we were selling hot dogs. And we were trying to impress upon him that, I think we got two different clientels here. But he saw like these people were eating our food, not his. So he called the police. Being a local guy, he had some friends on the force. The police came down, told the vendor to move. The vendor was operating well within the guidelines of the rules and the law and everything else. So I, when he called me on a two-way radio, because everybody had two-way radios, he said, what do you want me to do? Stand tough, don't move. I'll be down there in a minute. So I went zooming down there. My brother went zooming down there. Just about everybody in our, our office staff was down there. And we put the call out. Card number four, go down to Illinois and Pacific. Card number six, Illinois and Pacific. Car number three, Illinois and Pacific. And we surrounded this restaurant with about six carts. Well, this made them infuriated. The police started gathering in numbers. There were three cars, four cars, six cars. The police cars just kept piling up, and people start piling up. Because now they'd stop walking because there was something to see. It looked like some activity. And finally, it got a little bit heated where one of the, the vendor that was there originally, the police started pushing him, and this guy pushed back. And it was like, wow. As soon as he did that, it was a wrong move. They took out their nightsticks. They whacked him in the legs. He went down to the ground. They start kicking him. They were punching him. They were beating on this poor guy. That's why my feet is fucked up now. Police beat me, man. You know? I start wheeling her all around and trying to get in the middle of it and trying to knock a few of them down with my wheelchair or whatever. And one of the police unplugged my plug and said, you're not going anywhere. At that point, it was just bitter frustration. I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. I spit at some. And at that point, they just took us all away. They commandeered an ambulance. They they went up to an ambulance driver and put a gun to him at gunpoint, pulled their weapon out of their holster, and said, we're commandeering this ambulance because we've got to transport this guy to headquarters. So they came up with like, I don't know, $1,000 bail. So we just counted out $6,000 here, give us our guys. 
And in a matter of about 20 minutes, we were out on the street again, and we still had our one cart back on Illinois Avenue. Anybody that had an interest, which is the best means of attack for, for the city, was the health department and then the police. So they just kept putting the pressure on. But in the beginning, that's part of what made it enjoyable. I mean, it, was, it wasn't only the money, it was the excitement and the fact that, you know, wouldn't you like to have a battle with somebody where you knew you couldn't lose? So the law kept changing all the time. So all of a sudden, they come up with a police ruling one night that any cart that had a hitch on it was to be confiscated because now it was on a sidewalk and it was essentially a motor vehicle. So when this happened and the first cart was towed, we were out in the middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning, with acetylene torches, hacksaws, sawzalls, whatever you could think of, destroying our own equipment, cutting off the trailer hitches. And then the next day having to push them all in by hand and then modify the hitches. I mean, working in the office, I saw lots of strange expenses go by uh, for, for, you know, I mean, it was, a, it was a crisis management situation, so you had to improvise on the spot. Yeah, it got to the point where we were doing so much with cart repair and cart modification, where we not only repaired all our own carts, but we made our own water tanks and we made our own hot dog carts. We made about a dozen carts out of that facility. They kept changing the zoning of the warehouses. Uh, several problems with that uh, particular location. First is that uh, it appears that it isn't zoned correctly, but that we're not sure about that yet. We're checking checking that out. Additionally, there's not a mercantile for a, uh, that establishment because it's basically a warehouse type operation, which is not covered under the uh, the veteran statute. The first year we moved four times. And every warehouse move was fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. So it was just that without the money, they probably could have crushed us. But there was just so much money that okay, you want a new warehouse? Okay, let's go get another one. Uh -huh. And we just get another warehouse. Started getting too many eyes looking at us, and everybody was looking into our pockets, and it looked like the thing that everybody wanted to get into. So people start buying carts. And they start popping up here and there and everywhere like they're going to get into the business. So the guys that we had, they were used to making that money, and they wanted that corner. So it wasn't so much that myself or my brother would put pressure on people. It's the people that were running the cart that had to make the money, too, that they were you know, standing up for their own right. Well, at the time when it was going on, there was a very strong bond between all us vendors because there was so much money involved. Uh -huh. And we had to tough it out. Uh, things got rough at times, but, you know, we all lived through it. Finally, they, they demanded that we have some type of a meeting to really kind of like talk about this because they weren't getting their share of the market. We had all the good corners and we had all the men. And I rented a room at the Sands and we had our little meeting with the vendors and the, the owners, different owners. And at the end of that meeting, it was evident to me that these guys were now going to really start to be more aggressive. So after everybody left, we had our own meeting with all our guys, and we just said, that's it. From now on, our carts never leave the street. We'd send out a truck or a trailer with a clean cart that was all sanitized, and the vendor would just take his pots, put them on a clean part, on a clean cart, and everything would pass our, our Board of Health inspections. And we managed to keep all our corners because we never vacated. One time, when they really put the blitz on to get us off the street and tow our carts away, we ran out of carts. Forty-six carts were in the tow lot. Saul sent down six ice cream carts in the middle of winter, just so we could occupy the street corners. Well, the six carts didn't last too long. And once they were gone, we needed something to hold our corners. So we put balloons. Balloons filled with helium out on the street, uh -huh. just to hold the position. We told the vendors, like, for $20, don't sell the balloons. Hold the spots. Well, that was a short-lived time at the Nugget. Within an hour, one of the vendors called up 
He was out of balloons. <laughs> now things started to heat up. And at this point, three guys that were local guys to Atlantic City decided that they would get into the business, but they would take the wholesale approach. So Jim Mannion, Bob Cahan, and uh, Farron, I forget his first name, Bob Farron, uh, decided that they're going to open up Island Vets. They said, look, we'll give you, or we'll, we'll do just wholesale, and you do just retail. And I said, well, I don't really want to buy anything from you when I can buy it myself the same way you're buying it and save a lot of money. So with that, they took on a fourth partner, which were guys that were associated, call them whatever you like. They were the boys, and the boys had 25% of the wholesale operation. Now the boys decide, well, they need us because we're the retail. We're the buyers. So they take us out to dinner one night. And they said, they're going to be our partners. I said, well, we don't really need a partner. We're doing fine. I said, well, we think you ought to reconsider. I said, nah, I think we're doing fine. Well, the week that followed was probably the, the most hectic week of my life. Every time I turn around, it would either be tickets, police, uh, health officials, uh, anything you could think of. Uh -huh. The heat was on. One day, we noticed that we had a power failure. And we had big refrigerators that trucks would drive in to house all this food. And we had 10,000 pounds of hot dogs and just getting ready for a weekend. But somebody, there was a stooge somewhere on the inside because as soon as the problem started to surface, they had called the health department. And the health department got there. And your meat had to be between 33 and 42 degrees or 45 degrees. And our temperature was now down to where, or up to where the meat was 46 degrees. And the health department just came in, stuck a thermometer in it. And that was like a marginal cool where nobody was going to get sick from it. But it was within their realm to say, these are no good. And they confiscated all this meat, burned it all. We had people on the inside too. Yeah, I, I met my wife. She was a dispatcher for the police department. She kept hearing our names, you know, Spaluto, Spaluto. You know, what are you? She's saying, I, I got to find these guys. I got to meet this guy. What's this all about? And there was this guy on the corner, broke down with a motorcycle, and I just offered him some help. And lo and behold, it was Michael, and that's how we met. Being in the position, you know, the job that I had. Um, my father was a retired police captain. My brother. As a police sergeant and all of the things that that were going on I would say no we don't do these things the police don't do this innuendos would be made to me and you know it's just a, a not a very pleasant work environment yeah. after they found out that I was dating one of the Spaludos so I eventually had to leave my job <laughs> police had a 24-hour blockade on the warehouse nobody could come in or out police were in the front and we were running stuff out the back at three o'clock in the morning, we got guys running over the rooftops carrying boxes of hot dogs. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, it was it was crazy, but uh, you know it's what we had to do to operate. We were operating out of the parking lot at Caesars. Uh -huh. We moved on from our warehouse into a parking lot. You know, this, you know, it, I see it as it was all a, a a design plan to get us out of our operational area and put us into where we were dependent upon island vets. So finally we reconsidered, my brother and I talked, and I said, listen, I think we really ought to give them half of what we're doing because at least we're going to walk away with half. We keep going like this another week or two, we're going to have nothing. So we made the business the decision to, to kind of like go partners with them. So part of the deal was that they got 50% of our retail, and we got 20% of the wholesale. So now there are five principles in wholesale. Mannion, Farron, Cahan, the boys, the boys. <laughs> and diggity dogs. Uh -huh. 
So this went on for a while, and every week we'd sit down and we'd whack up the profits. Everybody got paid. I handled everything. I paid off everyone. And whatever was left, we split 50-50. Well, one week, one day I was getting out of bed and I broke my leg. And when I broke my leg, I had to go to the hospital to get it set. So I wasn't at the hot dog business. So my brother and the rest of the guys we took care of business. After my brother was hurt, it, uh, I guess it seemed like we were vulnerable. Because Pete wasn't there to watch what was going on. And, uh, you know, they came in, they wanted to, they wanted the money. You know, I called my brothers, you know, they want the money. You want me to give them the money? I said, nope, no money, business as usual. The end of the week, they come and we whack up what's left. Just because I'm in a hospital, the only thing changed is they come to the hospital room instead of the office. So he ran that by them. You know, they didn't like that. You know, they, they left, they came back a little later, and, you know, this is the way it's going to be. They came in four goons. <clears throat> they started roughing me up, you know, beat me, beat me down, and, uh, you know, attacked a couple of the vendors. And then the last straw was they pulled out a, an Uzi machine gun, and they shot up the whole ceiling. So it was a little intimidating, uh -huh. but still no money. So after all of this, they decided that they got to get rid of us because they're, they're taking over. So we catch wind that they've called the sheriff and they, they've set up the sheriff for the following day that they're going to have the sheriff come down and being that they're the controlling interest, they're going to push us out of the warehouse. Now we're on a, we'll be on the street and we'd be out of business. So they tried this, only in the meantime, when we found out about it, my brother and I had talked, and I said, listen, I understand that there's bad blood there between the boys and Mannion and Ferrin. Because Mannion and Ferrin had $10,000 each invested, and they got pushed out of the business because the way that these guys operated was they come in with a little piece, and before you know it, they got the whole thing, and everybody else is out in the cold. So I says, look, pick up Mannion and Farron, make them a deal, buy their shares from them, give them their $10,000 back, and let's get their shares. Now this is like 5 o'clock at night, 6 o'clock at night. So we couldn't get the lawyer till the next morning, and we had to get Mannion and Farron. So Michael says, what should I do? I says, kidnap them. Put them in the car. Take them for coffee. When you're about 30 miles away from where they live, tell them they're not going home until after we make this deal in the morning. And that's exactly what he did. So 9 o'clock in the morning, he was at the office with the two of them. They signed the papers. We gave them the money. Now we had 60% of the wholesale. Now all of a sudden, the sheriff comes. And their plan is to get rid of us, and they're going to have everything. So the sheriff comes and they tell him, look, we're controlling interest here and we don't want these guys in our warehouse anymore. We'd like you to remove their equipment and we'd like them out of here. And at that point, Michael had the stock and he says, no, wait, we've got 60% here. They've only got 40. And here's all the stock. And being that you're here, why don't you get rid of these guys because we don't want them here. And that's what happened. The sheriff put all of their stuff out on the street. They were out of the warehouse, and they were kind of like stuck, knowing what they were, like wondering what happened to us. Uh -huh. We're the boys. And they got kind of pushed out. Well, this didn't sit too well with them. So for about two weeks, everything was quiet. And they set up another warehouse out of Atlantic City in Pleasantville. And then all of a sudden, they came back with a full force of presence, tipping over our carts, uh, harassing our vendors, doing anything they can to try to take over some of the spots. They tur turn one of our carts right over, dump it over on the street, and we'd retaliate. At that time, one of our guys threw a a brick or a rock at one of the other guy's uh, trucks. 
next thing you know it, uh, he tried to run his truck through the hot dog cart and wound up hitting the mirrored glass outside walls of Bally's Graham. We, of course, had to retaliate. And I believe a, a cinder block found its way through one of their windshields of one of their trucks. <laughs> and that evening, I got a message on uh, the desk at the, the Sands Hotel. And the message was simply, every dog has its day. Man. When I went to work that morning, right after that, I found out that my, my truck had been firebombed and burnt through crisp. It was also a little bit of a shock to see that much violence. But that's what it took to sell a hot dog. That's what we had to do. We wouldn't give an inch. And we gave them a good run for their money. But in the meantime, the city came in and the city said, look, with all this that's going on, people could get hurt. So we're going to come in and take control, and we're going to regulate this business for the good of the public health and welfare. So the city came in, they numbered all the spots, they licensed all the vendors, they numbered all the carts, and created a rotation system. So now you only work every three days. And then it went to every 10 days. And now it's about every three weeks. And eventually it just got to the point where I didn't want to do it anymore, and I left. It was a, a, you know, a great time in my life. I, I, had, I had a ball. You know, it was a lot of money, you know, a lot of freedom, a lot of power, and it was, you know, it was great. It was a time in my life that I'll never forget. And it wasn't only the money, it was the whole fight, the whole excitement of it all. It was worth it. It was a great experience. I'd do it again in a heartbeat.